Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Jessica Espy, and I'm a senior advisor to the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And it's a real pleasure to be with you today um, for this truly hybrid event with half of us um, online and half of us, of course, being in Dubai. I'm very jealous. I wish I was with you all. Um, anyway, suffice to say, welcome to this third Global Solutions Forum, um, which is organized by the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network with partners GIZ and Panorama, and of course, co-hosted by GSTIC Dubai. Um, so today at this third Solutions Forum, we're going to be joined by some leading global innovators and thinkers, people who are really at the cutting edge of trying to find new solutions for the world's sustainable development challenges. We have got participants and speakers from Thailand, Bangladesh, Turkey, Cyprus and Colombia, uh, which is just amazing, um, and an esteemed Solutions Committee. Um, who are going to be joining with us today to reflect on some of the solutions and to offer their feedback. Um, the topics that we're going to discuss and some of the innovations we're going to hear about are really diverse. They cover things like community conflict and mediation, natural resource management, education, social media and local planning. So a real spectrum of issues from across all 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals. At the end of the videos and presentations um, and the committee's reflections, we're going to move to a, a panel discussion. And that's what I really hope we're going to get to hear from all of you, our participants, people in person and online. If you have questions and you want to put those to the speakers, we would invite you to do so by tweeting your uh, questions to us using the hashtag GSF. 2022. So that's hashtag GSF2022. Any thoughts, reflections or questions you might have, send them to that hashtag and then I will try and do my best to convey them to the panellists during our discussion. And then just before we close, to make sure that you stay for the full duration of our forum, uh, we're going to have a keynote um, talk from Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who I think needs no introduction. He'll be joining us at 1.5 GMT. Um, so just before the end of our two hour session. So without further ado, we're going to kick off this exciting um, segment of the agenda. Um, and we're going to start by going in turn to each of our, um, our solutions um, winners, our innovators. And we're going to listen to brief pre-recorded videos from them explaining their solution. And then we'll turn to our committee for their reflections and feedback. So first, allow me to present um, Saeed Namir, who's going to be joining us. Um, Saeed is um, joining us from Bangladesh, um, uh, where he um, is director of IPAG, and he's going to be talking about Digital Kick, which is a really exciting um, social media oriented innovation. So without further ado, over to the video from Saeed. We are very uh, excited to be sharing with you a story which unfolded last year, 2020, last quarter, as pandemic was uh, spreading fast in the world, including South Asia, which houses one fourth of global population, one third of global poor. There was a sense of restlessness working in us because as we see many, many people helpless, not having access to minimum required healthcare services, uh, daily laborers out of job, poor children out of school. So what could we do given a region of resource constraint? What could we do? And one of the things that came out in our mind, technology being a very cost effective provider of solution, how can we use technology to drive forward some of the major issues, particularly SDG issues that the region was facing? So IPAC came up with the innovative solution of Digital Kick, knowledge information content kiosk for supporting SDGs in South Asia. 
So Digital Cake actually houses 150 interactive audio visuals raising awareness regarding some of the key challenges that we were facing during the pandemic. The pandemic actually brought on a diverse range of challenges, including environmental challenges, dry, dietary challenges, social challenges, and even economic challenges. And talking about challenges, I mean, as you can fairly imagine, it would not have been possible for us to address all these challenges in a matter of three, four months. So we picked 10 key themes, which of course you'll get to see Depending on the unique socioeconomic conditions of any particular country or region, this model can be customized by basically connecting three key factors. One, what particular SDG challenge the country is facing. Second, who are the stakeholders who would benefit from this SDG solution. Third, what is the most appropriate digital platform to connect the rest of the two. Institute for Policy, Advocacy and Governance in Bangladesh. Um, that was brilliant and we look forward to hearing more about it from you in the panel discussion. But before then, we're going to hand over to our Solutions Committee. Um, so we've invited um, three uh, world, leader, world leading minds, thinkers, um, communicators to reflect on these solutions and share their thoughts and feedback. Um, we are joined today uh, all online um, by Michael Shank, who's the Director of Communications at the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance and the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Um, welcome, Michael. We're also joined by Martha um, Geta Chubakane, who's a lead analyst in East Africa for development initiatives. Um, who I'm so glad you managed to join us, Martha. I was worried we might not have you on the line. Um, so welcome. And finally, we're also joined by Asa Chao, who's a program officer for RUCN. Um, you are all um, experts in very different ways, so looking forward to your diverse perspectives um, on this first solution. So over to you. Maybe we can start with you, Martha. Thanks. Uh, hi. I'll so if you just uh, give me a few se few seconds to set up, and then I can come in after the next guest. Sorry. Sure. Okay. Not to worry. All right. Thanks, Martha. Well, well, we'll turn to Michael then. Michael, if I can put you on the spot, do you want to share some reflections on that first solution? Yes, thank you. And greetings, everyone. Great to be with you to talk solutions that are needed now more than ever before. Two things I want to highlight that I really like about this digital kick approach. One is that it's digital and interactive. I think now more than ever, given that people are closeted in their homes, in their communities, they are not out and about seeing what we're producing. The more digital we can be, the more visual we can be, the more use of video, that is the future. That's what people gravitate towards. And so I wanna laud the group for pulling together, it sounded like 150 uh, interactive visuals. That's the way we need to engage people going forward. And then secondly, I want to lift up their focus on resilience and mental health. We know now more than ever, given COVID, people need support for mental health. And so I want to laud that that was their priority. You saw the number one and number two focus, areas of focus, one resilience, two mental health. We need that support more than ever before. So I just want to give props and support for the, the digital focus, the interactive focus, the visuals and video. And then secondly, the, the subject matter around resilience and mental health needed now more than ever before. Fabulous, thank you so much, Michael. Isa, can we turn to you? Um, thank you everyone, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, this is really a great solution. I, I also like the digital part because we've seen with COVID-19 that we really need to be um, you know, online, to talk with people and also we can we can hear from you know other geographic areas but also i like the the um 
the, how the, the, the solution try to engage a lot of actors. You know, we have students. We also uh, need to engage more young people into solutions. But also, I see also in the solution that there is also a really um, good way to replicate, as um, my predecessor just said. They, they, they also target other countries, regions. They're, not, uh, they're, they're in South Asia, not only in Bangladesh, but uh, in also eight uh, other countries. Uh, so the, this can be also replicated, I would say, in Africa, but also in Europe. Um, how how um, do we know, you know, this can also be a really good way to um, engage other countries and also other regions. I also like the fact that the solution uh, doesn't only address um, one SDG, they, they address SDG 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 11. It's, it's, it's really a global view on SDGs, but also having this digital part, engaging other stakeholders, and also this replicability into other countries would also be a really good way uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. I said, yeah, very good point about the replicability there um, and exciting that they've already taken it to so many different um, countries across the region. Um, Martha, over to you. I hope you can hear us okay. Thank you. Yes, I can hear you. Um, I liked the fact that it considers uh, persons with disabilities because it has sight and uh, uh, sound uh, in it. But I want to play a bit of devil's advocate here and point out something. It strikes me as um, uh, to in order to have access to this uh, services, you need to have reliable electricity and connectivity. And um, that is something to really think about, especially if you're thinking of uh, going global and the scalability. Um, I also looked at who could potentially use this, and especially humanitarian agencies that assist people uh, who are in prolonged crisis or people living in conflict zones. So this is a very good initiative. So maybe in the recommendation part that I can think of they, uh, for them to think, you know, as much as uh, we want to have that digital service, uh, will it widen also the digital divide, meaning that those people who have access to connectivity all throughout are going to use this? And also the age bracket, is it the, the youth that we are targeting? Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Martha, and great to have some questions to put to uh, our colleagues from EPAG to, to reflect on when we move to our panel discussion, so thank you. Um, we're now going to um, a Zoom across the world to Cyprus, um, and I'm delighted that um, Stephanie Lale Shelu, who's the head of the School of Law and a professor of European Law and Reform at UCLan Cyprus, um, is, is going to be with us. Um, before we, we hear from Stephanie in person, we're going to listen to the video about this initiative. So over to the video um, from our colleagues at UC Land Cyprus. Today we are going to present you with a small insight into our long-term social mediation project. Question one, what was the initial problem and how did the team go about solving it? The project was developed from the social realities in Cyprus, which includes the historical division of the island, but which also has grown into being a multi-ethnic, multi-religious society despite the decade-long division. The project introduces social mediation as a tool for conflict resolution in a social context. The project problematizes concepts pertaining to uh, stereotyping and prejudices and tries to give uh, ordinary citizens the ability to uh, bridge differences and find common solutions to social problems. The solution that we are proposing through the social mediation program are compatible with the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and actually specific SDGs, among which SDG 4, SDG 5, 10, 16, and last but not least, 17 on partnerships for the goals. What is the one most innovative aspect about the solution? 
The most innovative aspect about the solution is probably its flexibility and easy adaptation to different social contexts. So basically, this is adaptable to any group, any community, any context, any societal challenge. The project also benefits from a rare interdisciplinary academia meets grassroots element. So we have the opportunity to bring hands-on research and apply it in practice in society. In question three, how can the solution be scaled and adapted to other contexts? Well, thinking about scaling the project, it's good to have in mind that the project already has a cross-border outreach and in the flexible form it adopts, it allows trained social mediators to introduce the methodology of social mediation as a conflict resolution tool to the needs and priorities of their respective concepts. In this regard, within an international context, the project envisages to partner up with initiatives from different parts of the world and train future social mediators, uh, giving them the opportunity to identify through their organizations who would benefit the most uh, within their own local context. In a few words, we want to go global and grow the sustainability of the network and the solution. Great, uh, thank you so much for that video um, from my colleagues from Cyprus. That's a very different uh, kind of solution. Obviously here we're talking about community social mediation. Um, so switching gears, um, I'm going to come to Aisa first uh, this time and would love your reflections. Thank you. Um, I, I really like this, this solution. Again, you know, like the, they're all very good solutions. Um, and, and here I really particularly like the citizenship empowerment, uh, um, citizen empowerment. They, 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 they have this lens of, um, you know, they produce uh, tools. They have this manual, they organize workshop, but also they, they created a network, which is also something, even if the project ends, we can have a kind of legacy there. And, and you know, uh, promoting social mediation is 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 so important because we living in a world like you know, there's a lot of conflict there and there, and and putting citizen into you know into the front line, giving them the tool, empowering them to 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 really find a solution to that. It's something we all need to be involved in. But also the, this also something uh, I also like about the, the project is the engage indigenous people and local communities, which is something we also have to look at. And the project is really doing that. Also, there is a kind of business engagement approach. There is a direct uh, engagement uh, with associations. Um, uh, you know, I work for IECN and also uh, during the Congress in Marseille, we had a CEO summit and it was um, highlighted there that we really need to engage with business to get them into action and also um, for us to get to um, implement the SDGs and this solution is really a good example, uh, which is showing that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Aisa. Um, Michael. A couple of things I really like about this approach, anything that normalizes conflict resolution, conflict mediation, those tools for public use, we need to promote as much as possible. In the United States, which is my context and country, we're seeing erosion of social capital. So anything that promotes, promulgates and normalizes conflict, peaceful conflict, nonviolent conflict resolution, I am a fan of. So uh, lauding, lauding this, initiative because we need to do more of it. And especially as we see climate change mobilizing uh, displacement and we're seeing mass migration of peoples, those new contexts and new, new Americans in our context in, in terms of migrants coming into new cultural contexts will likely see more conflict in response. And so this work is needed now more than ever before as we see this kind of mass mobilization, mass displacement, refugee numbers in the tens of millions coming from climate change and extreme weather. We're going to see more of this. So equipping communities with the skill sets needed to proactively and positively and constructively deal with conflict uh, is, is something we should scale globally. So I just want to give all my support for anything that normalizes these kind of tools. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Michael. Absolutely. It couldn't be more timely. Um, and Martha, over to you. 
thank you. Um, I really liked the gross, grassroots element that it has, uh, the fact that it wants to go global. But I wanted also for us, you know, like for instance, if you're taking the African uh, uh, case, conflicts are usually because of natural resources. It can be grazing land, water shapes, um, control of minerals and energy and so on. So when you have social mediation, you know, is there a mechanism, is there a framework where um, especially in social setups, those with larger population or control of some economic resources um, come out as winners. You know, when we're doing this, I'm sure this has uh, this element has been considered. So, but for me, is it more of like a prevention rather than a during conflict um, a mediation uh, approach? I would like to have. Uh, some ideas on that and then most importantly again in the context that I'm raising to take care and to really reflect on this mediation approach is not coming at the expense of having justice for those especially with mute voice or those who are vulnerable for instance ethnic groups or refugees or migrants as, as uh, Michael just mentioned so basically to just ponder about a, a, a strong MND framework um, of intended and unintended uh, impacts both, both positive and uh, negative thanks thanks Martha really thought-provoking remarks there and I hope we're going to come back to this in the discussion um, I'm afraid I've got to steer us on again. Uh, this is a real lightning tour of these solutions, but we'll have a chance to reflect in a bit more detail during the panel. So uh, now we're going to go to Colombia. Uh, we're going to turn to um, Carlos Eduardo Dominguez Moreno, who's a consultant to the Colombian Association for Sustainable Development in Industrial Ecology, who's joining us today uh, with the video from him and his colleagues um, on an eco park, which is very exciting. So now we'll turn to their video. Thank you. Y estamos aquí como integradores de todos los grupos de interés alrededor de un propósito común. Nuestro propósito es hacer un piloto escalable, replicable, que pueda fácilmente mostrar cómo al establecer un ecoparque alrededor de una microcuenca podemos generar nuevos ingresos para las comunidades rurales que viven alrededor, pero también adicionalmente cuidar el recurso hídrico, los bosques y la biodiversidad que ahí están en la zona. El principal problema se origina en las cuarentenas causadas por la pandemia del COVID-19, las cuales generaron dentro de las comunidades deficiencias alimentarias y de sostenibilidad. Para esto hemos propuesto la creación de unos ecoparques, los cuales ayuden a la generación de ingresos y a la sostenibilidad y bienestar de las comunidades. Consideramos que esta solución es muy innovadora, dado que integra muchos fragmentos. Uno encuentra ecoparques en otras partes, pero tienen elementos parciales. En este caso, este ecoparque primero, tú encuentras que la mayoría son unipersonales o de interés privado, mientras que este proyecto pretende establecer el ecoparque y entregárselo a las comunidades para que ellos sean quienes administren y tengan un sufructo del ecoparque. Pero adicionalmente también tiene que ver con todo este tema que comentábamos de el cuidado del agua, el cuidado del bosque, el cuidado de la biodiversidad mediante tecnologías simples. Entonces vamos a intervenir las viviendas de las comunidades que están alrededor para que tengan unas mejores tecnologías mucho más sostenibles y que ellos puedan multiplicar con los visitantes qué tan fácil es poder proteger mediante acciones como energías limpias o manejo de aguas o manejo de residuos y de sus proyectos sostenibles. Entonces, todos estos elementos se integran para generar unas alternativas que dan respuesta a los ODS a los que estamos aplicando. La solución es fácilmente escalable a partir de este modelo piloto que estamos desarrollando. Una vez que esté implementado y probado, se puede aplicar en cualquier comunidad que viva en el área de influencia de la cuenca de, una, de un río 
o de un afluente eh, hidrográfico. Todo dependerá de los recursos y de la participación de las comunidades. What a wonderful video, and I don't know about you, but seeing that gorgeous backdrop just makes me long to be in Colombia rather than cold England. <laughs> um, but yes, that was um, very inspiring, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about this community-led eco-park. Um, so back to our committee for their reflections. Uh, Martha, can we start with you this time? Yes, um, um, I really liked the fact that this is about community empowerment. Um, this is about community empowerment. So I really liked it. Um, I'm hoping that it considers three elements. Uh, one is having a watertight mechanism that uh, such initiatives are not uh, hijacked by powerful businesses or business companies or politica, the political elite. Uh, the other is having a conflict uh, uh, a resolution, a conflict resolution mechanism in it, and uh, thirdly, a mechanism of linking to a larger market. Maybe one question that I, I may have for the uh, Colombia team is that uh, I don't get uh, if community members are supposed to contribute on the resources uh, uh, during this initiative? And if so, will those uh, who are unable to raise their own funds have access to seed uh, capital? Thank you. But I really liked the community empowerment aspect of it. Excellent questions again. So thinking about um, seed capital for the community's engagement and also how you prevent private interests from potentially taking over. Um, great, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Isa, we'll come to you. Yes, thank you. I, I really like, um, again, they're all good solutions. I really like the fact that this connect, you know, people with nature. S sometime we, we lost this connection with into our daily job with COVID. We, we saw that we need to have a, a link with nature and they, they're creating this space to get a community, you know, like this kind of ecotourism, uh, getting involved into the nature, but also um, the local community, they, they're involved in the management. She said that they, they, they bring the local community to uh, make feel to to bring visitors to to visit the the park and also uh, let them know what is happening. This is also something which is interesting because we have to put human in the in the center of everything we're doing. And even if it's a project, we have to engage the local communities because it's it's first their space, it's the surrounding, it's the environment, and they have to be engaged in what the project is doing. I also second uh, Marta's comment. Uh, to, to ha what, how this is, uh, you know, putting into practice also to have more detail on how they, they engage with um, community, how, uh, um, uh, how to say, um, you know, fragile, the, 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 the local community can feel of, do they have a kind of steering committee to decide on how many people they bring to the park, because also we have to uh, take care of the nature people can visit but uh, see how we can also um you know uh, limit the damage um human can have on nature thank you great thank you so much lots of uh, lots of thoughts there i said um so hopefully we'll come back to a couple of those um michael um over to you finally yes well i will be redundant here based on the the wise words from martha and aisa but getting people into nature is critical building that attachment if we want to see behavior change when it comes to sustainability and climate change climate policy climate action we need to build those bonds for people with nature so that they have that connection so they don't want to lose that connection when climate change poses a risk to that bond, to that connection. So I love that this is nature focused. Getting people out in nature is critical. I love the local ownership, local management piece of it because that is uh, baking in long-term buy-in, which is great. And then the economic development component, the ROI, the return on investment. I think with all of our sustainability initiatives in the SDGs, we can easily make the case for economic development and the ROI. It takes a little creativity sometimes, it's always there. But that's so critical in terms of winning the hearts and minds and selling the concept to 
people in the community and outside the community. And I just want to lift up Martha's comments about conflict resolution mechanism, making sure that's in place, which is key, and also scalable to markets and access to markets. So uh, yeah, just redundant for what Martha and Isa said, but great comments all around. Great, thank you so much to all of our committee members and nice to see the sort of crossover between solution concepts here, thinking about the natural resource management, conflict management and so on. So um, exciting to see that integration. Um, we're now going to turn to our colleagues uh, with SDSN Turkey. Um, they have a very exciting initiative focused on kind of local capacity building and local training. Um, and so we're now going to have their video and then look forward to hearing from um, the executive director of SDSN Turkey um, which is Tamar Atabrut, um in during the panel. So to the video now. Thanks. We are very proud to collaborate with our partners and work for the cities with a great passion to prioritize SDGs to reduce carbon emissions, to adapt to climate change, and to inspire them to work SDG practices in the cities, such as sustainable transportation, renewable energy, and sustainable agriculture. We would love to share our story and our inspiration for our intensive action about the localization of the SDG 11 and SDG 13 at the level of municipalities. SDSN Turkey organizes education programs such as Cities 2030, Localization of Sustainable Development Goals, Sustainable Cities and Climate Change, Circular Economy and Zero Waste webinars among Turkish municipalities. SDSN Turkey works to raise awareness on climate action and build capacity of municipalities staff on preparing sustainable energy and climate action plan and take action for climate adaptation. Some of the municipalities already began to write voluntary local reviews. STSN Turkey contributed to the consulting, education and preparation process of voluntary local reports. These reports are the first voluntary local reports of Turkey. Upon intensive demands from these municipalities, we initiated our Cities 2030 Localization of Sustainable Development Goals education programs in 2020 and 2021. In our first workshop, the representatives of 24 Turkish municipalities declared their intent to help limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030 with the Cities for Climate Action Declaration. Over 1,000 people working in, in the municipalities have participated to our courses and 35 municipalities have built their sustainability offices. SDSN Turkey also works to ensure that local studies are included in national and international reports. We thank SDSN Global and Global Solutions Forum for inviting us to share our experience. Fabulous. Um, another great video there um, from our colleagues at SDSN Turkey. Um, and also nice to sort of, again, change gears, think a bit more about working with local municipalities, local government actors and um, capacity development and training uh, to support different scales of government to engage with the SDGs. Um, Michael, um, you work very much uh, with cities, local governments and municipalities. I would love to hear your reflections. I do indeed. I'm biased. So I work for the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, we're a global nonprofit, and I'm biased in the following way. Two reasons I like working with cities. 
cities can move a lot faster than national governments. So on, on the climate front, in climate policy, we're seeing a lot of movement in cities that national governments just aren't able to move on. The US is another great example here where cities are moving fast and furiously towards a decarbonized future, whereas the national government isn't moving as fast as it should for reasons folks may know if they're reading the news. So why I like working with cities is that they can move quickly on some of these fronts. And then secondly, they're closer to the public. So when we think about winning the hearts and minds and building public and political will, a lot of people know their mayor, a lot of people know their city council or whatever city leadership they have. And so there's a relationship there that is helpful when we think about behavior change and sustainability that often isn't there when we think of national governments. So there's a relationship locally, the mayor, the city council, the city leadership is closer to the public. So when it comes to winning the hearts and minds, it's a little easier. So I'm very excited to see what Turkey is doing in this space and SDSN Turkey is doing in this space. And uh, again, biased because I love working with cities. And also just quick note, I am seeing on Twitter questions coming up using that hashtag. So I just want to give a shout out to folks to keep using the hashtag on Twitter to ask questions. Over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Michael. A very good reminder. Do keep them coming in at hashtag GSF2022. Um, great. Uh, Martha, can we turn to you? Okay. Uh, who am I to speak about this vertical? But I have a few uh, reflections. I wanted to reflect on the stakeholders that might be interested uh, to learn from such a solution. I would imagine all municipalities around the world and also UN agencies and other uh, local and international actors that are working on climate change and sustainable cities as well as agriculture. Maybe two, two observations here uh, just to emphasize the need because you're talking about trainings and education and workshops, the need to have um, a strong monitoring and evaluation framework to follow up and also track the implementation of the action plans that are developed jointly. That is one uh, observation that I have. The other element that I really liked is about the voluntary local uh, reports, because I also work on VNRs. Um, it is a very good one, but just to, to say that um, it is also good to have a shadow report from citizens or civil society organizations uh, in parallel with the VLR so that you also end up having a kind of an accountability stakeholder that will also hold your leaders uh, uh, accountable. Thank you. A great suggestion. Thanks, Martha. Um, great. Um, and finally, uh, to you, Isa. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I just would like to highlight the fact that um, I'm really happy to say that we have the solution on Panorama web platform. We collect solutions all over the world and they're all available free database to um, have a look at them. And we have particularly the solution on Panorama platform. And we have also um, two good building blocks there, which we call the key ingredient, which um, make the solution really uh, successful. We have the education on SDGs and the cooperation part, the way uh, we see uh, local communities, but also um, uh, public authorities, you know, working together and also having this joint reflection on localizing SDGs. This is something we should also look at. It's also a super good way to 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 implement the SDGs locally because what my work in um you know in Kenya would not be the same in Turkey so they they take the 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 um, objective and the localize this is something which is really good in this project and they also they have this measure uh, to to produce a low uh, a voluntary report which is something which also gives a status of uh, what is uh, happening there and what they have done so far and also which can be sent to um, the UN to all international organizations also uh, uh, to to inform about the, the status of the SDG implementation in this specific area which is something I really like about the project um, also the impact I see that they have like kind of thousand municipality uh, that were involved in this project which is also super great and then uh, something they could also do would be to uh, look at each staff what they have done locally because when you um, you part of a project or you follow a course you you uh, you know you you share with friends with family which can also be an impact they can report on really a good project export them thank you 
Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. And yeah, great to see that this is a project that's sort of meeting both those building blocks, so engaging with local communities, but also uh, connecting to policymakers and local officials. Um, and thank you for the reminder as well that all of the solutions you're hearing about today and many more are available on the Panorama website. So do have a look at that as well. Um, now we're going to turn to our final uh, solution. Um, our final innovation for us to reflect on today, um, and that is coming to us from Thailand. Um, and joining us is Chol Bonang, who's the Assistant Professor at Thammasat University in Thailand. And this solution is also looking at subnational levels of government and specifically regional SDG dialogues. Um, so over to the video um, from our colleagues in Thailand. Hello, my name is Chon Bunna from SDG MOVE, Faculty of Economics, Thammasat University. We are the national host of SDSN Thailand. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the project Area Needs Report for the formulation of Thailand Science Research and Innovation Strategic Plan. The initial problem of our project is that after the reform of national research system in 2019, the National Research Strategic Plan was quite top-down with little input from local stakeholders. As a result, we developed a process to identify local needs, focusing on regional level and related knowledge gaps, and use this process in 2020 and 2021. We have also worked with six regional teams of scholars from eight different universities all over Thailand. There are four steps in this process. First, horizon scanning. We use SDG as a framework and review related regional level secondary data to identify a set of preliminary key regional issues. Second, scoping down. We use the Delphi methods to engage with and ask opinion from regional experts to identify top 10 key regional SDG issues. Third, regional foresight workshop. After the key regional SDG issues were identified, the regional foresight workshop was organized for each region. Around 30 to 40 participants from various sectors joined and discussed about the future they want regarding the key issues. Both knowledge gap analysis. The findings from the region uh, foresight workshop are used in an analysis done by the regional team to identify the research is issue to close the gap. And we, the central team, SDG MOVE, synthesize the findings. The output of the process was used in the formulation of the science research and innovation strategic plan. The most innovative aspect about the solution is that it is the first time the science research and innovation policy is localized based on SDG framework to identify knowledge gap. We also apply several tools from foresight methods in the process, which make it very participatory and forward-looking. The key to adapt this process to other contexts is the network, the access to data, and engaging with the policy makers. Thank you. Great, uh, another fabulous video and exciting to see that this highlights the importance of trying to take, trying to make national strategies more inclusive, uh, more participatory, but also um, exciting to see that there's been such wide university collaboration across the country because um, it's not just all of us that need to collaborate with government, but of course different stakeholders need to collaborate between each other so and amongst each other. So yes, another great project. Um, I'm now going to have the final round of feedback from our panel. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Isa. Ais, thank you. Um, this is also a good one. As, as you know, IECN is a um, organization. We have a lot of uh, scientists and, and looking at the local researcher engagement in this project, you know, like I'm, I'm also happy to see that we can put science and, and, and also science innovation together and deliver on SDGs. Um, the, the building block in the, the project are, you know, we have the, the engagement of local researchers, we have the um, technique, the views, you know, it's, it's, it's really innovative. We also have this data collection, you know, like 
in order to, to deliver or to inform in something, you need data, you need to measure the quality, but also the quantity. So, so they, they, they put together all these ingredients and, and deliver it on a kind of shared governance uh, um, uh, model. This, this is also interesting to see that how we can put a lot of people together in different disciplines, but they can come together and, and deliver on one thing with a uh, common objective. Also, it's this kind of diversity we, we can also um, benefit from. And this project is really uh, a good way to show that how we can um, see uh, this innovation working. And uh, yeah, I think this is also a great, a great way to see how we can implement SDGs, but also uh, it also responds to this um, policy uh, challenge we have now, but also COVID-19. I just see in the challenge that due to COVID, they were also forced to exclude some participants. I would like to also just emphasize that, you know, like it has to be inclusive. We all have to bring people together, but yes, uh, given the situation, they couldn't do that. It, it's really uh, interesting to see uh, this urban part, this uh, uh, science research and also national, international and diversity coming together. Thank you. It's, it's really good. Thanks, Isa. Yes, absolutely. Um, again, as you said, very inspiring to see um, that it's a sort of a very practical example of research and policymakers collaborating together. Um, great. Um, uh, Michael, can I turn to you next? Yes, two very quick things. And I'll give an example. In my role at Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, I'm moving from a director of communications to a director of engagement. And that's illustrating the shift that's happening in our cities from kind of the traditional monologue of communicating to the public versus engaging with the community and really changing the paradigm of engagement. So it's more inclusive, so that we're crowdsourcing ideas, so that we're finding participatory ways to involve the community, engage the community. So even training up our cities in appreciative inquiry, which is a model that I've used in the past and that others have used in the US context and with corporates uh, to, to make sure every voice is heard and included and empowered in the process. So we're seeing the shift in our cities. So I love the shift here too. And then secondly, what I like about the horizon scanning and some of these foresight, foresight techniques is that we're staying nimble and adaptive to new dynamics. And if COVID has taught us anything, it's that we need to, in our resilience approach, stay nimble and adaptive in this kind of horizon scanning, horizon scanning always seeing what's coming our way is really helpful to retaining that nimble adaptive approach to whatever might come our way. So those are the two things that really stuck out to me. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Um, and finally, Martha, can I turn to you? Yes, uh, I want to comment on, again, on leave no one behind. Um, so first, I really liked the analytical approach and the deliberate uh, steps to engage uh, stakeholders. Um, when I was listening about the horizon scanning, the scoping down, it just strikes me as you just have to get it right from the start. Whose voices are amplified? How about those that are whose voices are usually mute. Uh, so are you involving unions of persons with disabilities, associations of women with disabilities, for instance, I'm just giving you an example of those that may not be included in such processes usually. And I'm taking the context of uh, many other countries. So get it right from the start, have your criteria. One thing I really liked, liked about this uh, project is that uh, the presentation says they adopted uh, an SDG framework which ensures that uh, the leave no one behind agenda is uh, an integral part in the assessment and scoping. One thing I really wanted to point out is I can see that this uh, would need a huge input from data but in circumstances where you have a limited or lack of timely and reliable disaggregated data by sex, by age, by location, by disability type and so on, you know, you need to think beyond official data. Uh, so have a template of, if already not uh, included, have a template of data landscaping, data mapping, so that you also include, include data that is collected unofficially by uh, so many implementing agencies. Thanks. 
Thanks so much, Martha. Before um, we have to say goodbye to our, um, our great committee, I want to give them a chance to say sort of a closing word each. And the question I want to put to you all is, with all of these really exciting solutions, which are all hyper-local and very relevant to their specific context, what is one thing you think we really need to think and keep in mind when we're thinking about scalability? You know, when all of the different challenges we face right now, all the transboundary issues we face, of course, we have to stay contextual and hyper relevant to our locality. But how do we also sort of prioritize replicating things, moving quickly, doing stuff at scale? What's you think one really important ingredient um, for identifying scalable solutions? So sorry to put you on the spot, but that's your final remark. And then I'm afraid we have to say goodbye to our wonderful committee members, uh, Martha, Issa and Michael. Um, so let me turn first to Michael, because you're smiling. <laughs> so Michael, to you. Thanks. Yes. So naturally, my bias is as a communicator and now a director of engagement for CNCA. So I think of everything as a media moment and as a messaging moment. And given that we're quite a small world, now, thanks to social media, when I think of scalability to this question, making sure that we are communicating every possible opportunity afforded us in every bit of this process. So from beginning, middle and end, as we're building out these solutions, communicating to the world, whether it's on social media, whatever your platform is, but seizing every media moment and messaging moment, it may feel a little exhausting to think like that, but there's so many small little lessons learned throughout the process that we should be sharing with the world, with our community, with the global world, since we're so interconnected. So that's the scalability answer that I'll provide here. And a very good one too. Thank you so much, Michael. Absolutely. There's so much innovation going on amongst local communities, academic groups, and so on that really don't tend to prioritize sort of self-promotion, communication, and so on. And without that, uh, we can't learn lessons from one another or scale things up. So absolutely, a very good reflection. Thank you. Um, Isa, over to you. Yes, thank you. Like my two words um, are cooperation, like collaboration, but also digitalization. Because now I am able to talk to and uh, get access to this room because, you know, I'm not in Dubai, but I, I, I can see you, I have internet. And also I know about the project because um, the online, I would say like, um, as Michael said, communication, but also, you know, getting into more digitalization, put them online, you know, um, bringing people together to collaborate together. It doesn't have, uh, uh, we don't have to be limited by, um, you know, like uh, someone is in Peru and then we, we cannot bring him in Dubai or we cannot bring him in, in Guam, but it, uh, the person has to be part of the, the, the community. We have to, to get them the chance to speak, uh, to have the voice. We, we really need to see that, but also, uh, you know, when there is a lot of people coming to, together, diversity is key and uh, we can achieve magic. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I think we've got a theme emerging here, but I'm going to wait for what Martha has to say. Uh, Martha, your final uh, words. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So as your uh, leave no one behind guide, I would say go for those initiatives that cannot afford to neglect and that make deliberate effort to include those that are often neglected and those that are often forgotten. And that would be my advice. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Martha. So we've got communications, digital cooperation and collaboration and inclusivity as our three big takeaways. Thank you so much to our excellent um, committee of speakers from to Martha, Isa and Michael. Um, you've provided really good insights and I hope we're going to dig into them now in our panel discussion. I do know that some of you have to go. So um, thank you for your time. And on behalf of everyone who's in Dubai and online, um, a virtual applaud. So thank you very much. We're now going to move back to our, um, our panelists, to the, the representatives from each of the projects that you've heard about today and have a chance to hear from you and put some questions to you. And I'm delighted that um, Saeed, Stephanie, Carlos and Tamara are all able to be there in person in Dubai. I'm just sorry, I can't be with you all. Um, and uh, wonderful that Chol and I have the privilege of being able to connect digitally. Um, so hello to you from our various corners of the world. So um, 
if I can start uh, with our with Saeed, our colleague from Bangladesh, to reflect on your your project. Um, Saeed, when you first uh, kind of thought about doing something that was social media oriented, what were the kinds of people or communities you were trying to target? Could you tell us a little bit about sort of some of the intention you had in designing um, a social media project? Or who you would, who you would be yeah, thank you. Actually, South Asia, some of um, some of you must be aware of, is has a lot of uh, contradictory uh, facts. This is one of the fastest growing region in the world before the pandemic struck. But this also is a region where one third of global poor live. So when this was unfolding, as you can fairly imagine, in the initial days of the pandemic, many like many other developing countries and regions, there was a struggle of not being having access to adequate healthcare services because this is one of the very densely populated region of the world. So social distancing, all this kind of stuff simply doesn't work in that part of the world. So you have a lot of issues, infrastructure issues, healthcare issues, access to vaccine issues. And if you remember at the time, it came out in the national media how many people's life were perishing, people struggling to have the ventilator. So a sense of restlessness was working in us. What can we do? Given the fact, even with wealth, you can't travel, or even without wealth, you don't have access. So the first thing that came into our mind uh, that uh, the digital tools and technology are one of the very uh, cost-effective means to reach out to those population. Now the question is, how do you make it in a manner that is understandable? Because you're also dealing with the population, not all of them are literate. So all this thing in mind, we made it very simple. We identified the vulnerable marginalized groups, women, children, poor people, daily laborers. And one of the good thing is because uh, smartphones and other things, price have come down significantly. So many of the people had access to those devices. So the challenge is how do you speak in a manner, communicate in a fashion that is understandable? And secondly, once you do that, how do you scale up and get connected? So as we moved, but we're very pleasantly surprised to see the sort of responses we are getting. So that sort of injected a dose of confidence that what we're doing makes sense. It's connecting, people are responding. So whether you are a helpless woman, a victim of domestic violence, not being able to get out, you're in lockdown to give you a helpline, or you're a small business owner who have his business shut down, what are some of the available access to financial resources that you have? So these are very really small, small stories I can share with you, but all those small stories have an element of lesson for all of us. That's how we scaled it up, and within three, four months, if you look at the reach, 20, 30 million people, that shows the responsiveness. So that was the sort of initial idea, and we were fortunate it worked well, people responded, and we scaled it up. Thank you Thank so you much. So much. Um, um, absolutely. I think I've heard, heard before heard from heard one of the Congress members that sort of using digitalization as an outreach tool and for inclusion is just so, so fundamental, fundamental uh, during the pandemic. For those of us who are fortunate enough to have devices, it's been a real lifeline while we've been, um, you know, in isolation, often without access to public areas or green um, space and so on. So, Absolutely, a really, really invaluable. Thinking about um, other ways people can cope with the pandemic, um, a lot of people refer to really wanting access to green space and to community areas, and that means about the initiative from Colombia and the idea of this community co park. So I wonder if I could turn to Carlos and ask Carlos. Um, what the community people part um, uh, partly motivated by the events uh, with the pandemic? Did you see it as something that could really benefit communities being able to get out and get access to the natural world? Gracias por la pregunta. El, casualmente el eje central de la, o la idea central de desarrollar el proyecto es porque la pandemia efectivamente eh, afectó y sigue afectando a las comunidades, sobre todo las comunidades rurales que son 
las que normalmente estamos tomando para este ejercicio. Las comunidades rurales tienen dos características que las afectan enormemente. La primera es que muchas de ellas producen elementos o, o producen los alimentos que requieren las ciudades, pero al crear las cuarentenas y los cerramientos de, las, de la ciudad, entonces estas personas no pueden llevar sus víveres y sus productos a donde los compran. Entonces eso inmediatamente les genera que se quedan sin ingresos para su subsistencia. La segunda es que ellos automáticamente por estar cerrados, entonces tampoco pueden traer los otros víveres y los otros alimentos, no pueden tener acceso a la salud, no pueden traer herramientas que necesitan para el campo. ¿Por qué? Porque como no hay comunicación entre las comunidades rurales y urbanas, entonces ellos quedan cerrados y sin posibilidad de poder compartir y poder generar los negocios. La idea central del ejercicio es que a las comunidades tener y mejorar su producción alimentaria con la parte de los huertos organizados, no un huerto cualquiera, porque ellos <coughs> siembran mucha cosa, pero siembran poco alimento que pueden consumir directamente. Entonces, digamos que ahí se logra un primer paso, que es tener una seguridad alimentaria. La segunda parte de la producción, pues ellos podrían implementar más, unos mejores sistemas de trueque para que el que tiene leche le pueda entregar leche al que no la tiene y puedan hacer otro tipo de intercambios de esta manera. Entonces, esa es la razón por la cual este proyecto lo que le apunta es a que las comunidades, cuando estén encerradas por las cuarentenas, tengan maneras de subsistir de una manera eh, decente, una manera segura, una manera que no los lleve y, los lleve, y más bien lo que haga es incluirlos en una situación de pobreza y desfavorabilidad enorme por el tema de la pandemia. So thank you for the question. Um, so the main idea of this project is um, to give to, uh, due to, to the pandemic, um, all the communities, um, the rural communities in the countryside that were very isolated, they were not able to sell back what they were, were producing for the cities and they were not uh, able to take with them uh, what they need to produce and other items. So the main idea of the project, uh, even if it's around the watershed and the protection of um, the, the watershed and the, um, all the, this environmental um, context, um, is very focused on give and teach the communities to be autonomous on um, the food and all what they need Um, so the idea is like for the bike yard farms, uh, very organized, so they can produce what they need for them, but also to share with the community between them. So that gives them also the possibility to get rid of money because they are back to exchange between those that have milk, um, those that will have potatoes. So the idea is really to bring back to the community the ownership of Um, the land where they live, the watershed to be protected, and that this project um, bring to them also this autonomy, autonomy that will protect them from being isolated um, with, in conditions of uh, like the pandemic. Great, Great. Thank, thank you, thank so, you much. so much. As soon as trying to instill in yeah. local communities the kind of skills Um, and, and the local independence to be able to, to ride the kinds of um, uh, crises that we've seen with the pandemic. Um, that makes me uh, want to, to go to our, our colleague Chol, who's online. Um, I'm, I'm changing the order slightly from uh, what you might see in your agenda speakers, but I just want to jump to my co uh, colleague in, in Thailand, because of course you were thinking about how to localize this national planning process, this national innovation strategy, was the idea of encouraging local sustainability, local independence, um, and, and local sort of self-sufficiency, something that came into your discussions um, uh, about how to localize this national strategy? Um, yeah, I think I think the issues of um, local independence or I would say like a bottom-up approach of development actually came up when we when we discuss um, 
in the original Forsyth workshops. I, I mean, um, at the moment, Thailand is quite uh, centralized in terms of development um, policies and also the research policy. So actually, they were quite appreciated that we try to include them into the process. And one of the ideas that came up every region is, is that they really wanted to um, have a chance to have a say in how their region is um, going to be developed their economic policies, environmental in, environmental policies, social policies, they want to have a say in it. Yeah. Brilliant, absolutely. And and can I just, just one more question for you um, while you're on the line, Sean, since we've got good connection right now. Um, can I ask, how did you, how did you engage the national government? I mean, this, you have to get the national government's buy-in for this to be sort of taken up and for your regional consultation to be ultimately effective. How did you do that? Yes, uh, I think I think the key the key ingredient is like the social capital that that our team has with the uh, the research planning agency. I mean, SDG Move have been, has been working on the SDGs for six years now from the very beginning of, of the process. And we have been um, we have been trying to be uh, like the knowledge hub and try to support of social capital uh, with them so uh, this time when when they want to localize the um, the research policies uh, they came to us because they want us to integrate SDGs into the process and then when we when we sell them the ideas of localizing using the foresight uh, instruments to increase like participation they um, already buy in from the beginning so so we kind of design the project together um, so uh, to make sure that the outcomes of the project is usable and in time for them so that it can be integrated into the policies. So so uh, to conclude, my answer is I think the key is like uh, the social capital between between the academic sector and the policy sector and also the core design uh, of the project so that um, they can use the outcome of our project. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I think that leads quite nicely to our colleagues from SDSN Turkey. Uh, and Tamara, if I can turn to you, um, obviously you were working at the regional level as well, your projects um, targeting municipalities. Uh, what inspired you to focus at, at this level and to engage with municipalities specifically? Yeah, thank you, Jessica. First of all, uh, warmest uh, greetings from the warm Dubai. Uh, as Michael has uh, stated just a minute ago, to work at the cities is a passion. But besides the passion, I should uh, admit that it's not an uh, easy task because it's, they are uh, very complex uh, structures and uh, there are lots of uh, challenging issues, uh, including the cities, so it's not an easy task. But anyhow, in every step, in every stage of uh, working with the SDGs in the local level, uh, I believe that uh, the focus and the importance of the education is uh, critical. And therefore, with the uh, belief of this thought, and we approach uh, to the municipalities, first uh, make a, an uh, open call to them, to meet them together, and to work on the different SDGs. For instance, uh, we make an initiative uh, to work on the SDG 13 for the uh, climate change. And uh, we organize a two-day workshop at the university, uh, but together with our partners, because we believe that the partnership is very critical. And we work uh, collaborating with different NGOs and uh, with different uh, international uh, institutions. And uh, at the end of this uh, workshop, we realize that there is a a, a, a big necessity for the capacity building in the cities. Therefore, we uh, just developed the, uh, the program, the training program, and we implemented also with, uh, together with our uh, stakeholders. And uh, in addition to this, we also initiated a VLR uh, process in the cities because we believe that VLRs empower the uh, local sustainability by encouraging the uh, cross-sectorial collaboration within the local administration, and uh, they are very powerful accelerators uh, of the localization of the SDGs at the city level, and they help to uh, realize the current situation and also to monitor and evaluate the, uh, the SDGs implementation in the uh, city level. And 
we applied a quadril helix mo model, which is uh, including the public authority, industry, academia, and the citizens. And all together, we work together, uh, starting from the uh, initial phase to the end of the reporting. And uh, we all learned in this process. So I believe, and we also believe in SDS and Turkey, the partnership is very critical and uh, a good tool to open a uh, lot of uh, difficulties. Thank you so, Thank you much. so much. Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. Partnership, Partnership and, and cooperation, cooperation and, uh, uh, are common themes from everyone. Um, and I think that takes us nicely to um, thinking about the one of the more hyper-local um, solutions that was presented um, and turning to Stephanie, uh, who's joining us um, from Cyprus, to think a bit about the social mediation tool that you you talked about how can you know i'd be interested to know uh, how did you identify this as the solution to some of the tensions you were seeing um, amongst communities thank you very much for the question thank you for the interest um, how we identified well we we work with any potential societal challenge uh, that can be triggered uh, among individuals, among groups of individuals, among communities, uh, groups of interest within communities or across communities. So uh, it is basically um, documented or evidenced through research that we do, and uh, it is a realization of what's happening on the ground. So I'd like to come back to what we discussed on localization. Um, Sustainability starts or should start from the local level, from the grassroots level. Um, that is because uh, only when securing local participation, engagement, and empowerment of people and groups and communities can we expect a sustainable solution to be designed and work. So to go back to the points that were made by uh, Michael and Aisa, for example, uh, Michael spoke about, uh, I like very much that expression, he said about the normalization of conflict resolution tools. Uh, every uh, situation has its challenges, every uh, social tension has its, um, its um, you know, factors, its characteristics. So for us, it was a matter of observing what was happening. Uh, we started in Cyprus with um, basically um, the partition of the island and, and what that meant for people living on both sides, on both uh, sides of the divide. And we tried to bring them closer to each other by explaining and by training towards understanding the other. But that can be repeated in, with every societal problem, and this is what we did when the pandemic stroke. So when the pan pandemic stroke, we actually took this opportunity to revisit what we had done before, knowing that the pandemic had had a phys physical impact on communities in Cyprus because the physical movement was actually not possible. So every societal challenge, um, brings with it um, uh, challenges, obviously, but also solutions that can be implemented through social mediation. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much, so Stephanie. Much, um, um, really interesting reflections on this brilliant project. Um, it, it makes me want to go back to our colleague, Carlos from Colombia, to think, and, and this also chimes with the question that we've received on Twitter, which is how are you working to encourage community engagement with your eco park initiative? And I asked that also thinking about Stephanie's um, point there, which is that you know you need to from the very beginning have all the actors understanding and working together to support the effort. Otherwise, of course, it can create tension. Um, so yes, how are you working to engage communities in your program? Gracias. Eh, la pregunta y la inquietud es perfecta porque cuando nosotros estuvimos en el grupo desarrollando las iniciativas desde el mes pasado, del mes de marzo del 2021, una de las sugerencias del grupo que coordinó todo este trabajo que hicimos con G y Z era casualmente que 
la, aquellos proyectos que no fueran seleccionados como eh, o que no fueran seleccionados por cumplir con las expectativas de ser iniciativas, de tener la eh, replicabilidad y escalabilidad, pensáramos en qué manera los podíamos incorporar a los proyectos que finalmente resultaran seleccionados. Y casualmente el proyecto de Stephanie es uno de los proyectos que nosotros siempre consideramos que son importantes a tener en cuenta por la clase de iniciativa que es, que es la que va a ayudar a reducir o a mejorar las relaciones entre los miembros de las comunidades. Eso es en Colombia y en las comunidades que uno vaya y trabaje, en todas va a encontrar el mismo problema, porque pues eso casi que es propio de la raza humana, los, los conflictos. Entonces, eh, esta es una herramienta y el empoderamiento entre las comunidades, haciéndoles trabajo social para que puedan lograr ese entendimiento y entiendan además que si trabajan unidos de una manera fuerte, pues la comunidad sale adelante y puede alcanzar lo que se proponga. Gracias. So, thank you for the question. Um, when we were discussing a month ago all the projects, um, it, it was evident that it was important to use um, the ideas of those projects that were not selected or even those that were selected um, to integrate them on this project also. So one of the examples is the um, project from Stephanie about the communities because he, the co here the community is key. Um, it's human nature to have conflicts. So as here the project is with the community for the community, it's important that they um, that we limit the conflict between them, and to make them our understanding that this project um, needs them to be together and to work together. Um, is somehow saying that to not let anyone behind, but it's also that we need to do it together. So the project from Stephanie brings this. Um, component of limiting and um, yes, limiting the conflict in the community itself, eventually also with the other stakeholders, so they can really be empowered to make this project their project and make it happen. Brilliant, thank you so much. And how um, lovely it is to hear that there are already some, there's already exchange of ideas between our solutions um, providers and innovators here and that you know we're, we're taking things across different contexts um i wanted to come to, to you said um and your efforts in bangladesh because um you noted and and michael commended the, your initiative for having a strong focus on things like mental health um and so on i wondered to what extent you've considered things like conflict um you know and uh, domestic conflict and concerns that has emerged from the pandemic i saw on your list you had um you know you, you identified things like domestic violence as potential concerns you know is community conflict a strong theme um of the kinds of materials you were trying to pull together and something that you wanted to share resources with the general public on uh, thank you jessica no, yeah, I mean, you see, whatever the issue may be, whether you're building an eco park or you're um, a sort of working on small scale business enterprises or you're trying to respond to the pandemic driven uh, health issues, one of the uh, pleasant discoveries, uh, particularly in course of doing this project, uh, we have been very pleasantly surprised that people who are living on the margins are not necessarily very really resource rich, how they could be so resilient and how they could bounce back. And you alluded to the issue of uh, domestic violence. And as you know, when people are locked down for uh, days, weeks, months, uh, there are, even, even, even in the developed, I mean, the more upper or affluent part of the society, there's a tension that generates within homes. And you can imagine those living on the margins, 
uh, hardly making days means the tension soars up. So the great discovery was uh, when we had reached out those messages, I'll give you an example of what happened with one of the countries in Pakistan. I mean, we were quite uh, overwhelmed by the sort of responses we got from a lot of women who reached out to us and were asking that in addition to the helpline number we gave them, what are some of the counseling uh, side they can have? And when we reached out to some of those experts, we were quite uh, pleasantly surprised how they quickly responded and what started maybe one, two uh, small queries from women who were affected quickly synergized and built up a community-wide interaction exchanges because initially, as you can imagine, there's a lot of name and shame goes on. People don't want to speak up. But once you've given them a voice, it's such a great discovery how many voices join in and what starts with a very small response becomes a social resistance for good reasons. I mean, many men also who are stuck there are maybe people who have lost jobs, who are in a frustrating situation. And uh, the sheer magnanimity of people who are living on the fringes to come out and make available whatever limited resources to ha they have in support of their you know, fellow peers, their brothers and sisters in the same community was an amazing experience. So while we talk about digital tools, it is very important. We do not lose sight of the human component. That is the most driving force. Digital tools are necessary because they make the connectivity easier. They make the reach out much more feasible. But we should never lose oversight. End of the day is the human beings, is the human connection, is that empathy, is this community-wise fellow feeling. And if in that process, our initiative, the digital tools have done that, we are just a connector, nothing more than that. Connector for a good reason. So no matter which project initiative you take, end of the day, it's the human connectivity, resiliency, feeling, empathy, broadly speaking, community spirit, that brings us to the solution, that leads to the problem solving, plant you that all we are working for. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed. Um, absolutely invaluable remarks, and I don't think anyone could ever disagree with that. I mean, if COVID has shown anyone, anywhere, in whatever community you live, um, and it's touched everyone equally, is the fact that, um, you know, we've all felt a bit more isolated than ever before. Um, and even if you live in a, in a crowded place where the infrastructure doesn't necessarily permit that, your life has still been disrupted um, in ways that you couldn't have imagined, and that's affected your community networks. And I think, um, yes, as you say, you know, these these platforms, these social media mechanisms, these, and so on, are a really useful uh, vehicle. But you know, what has made us feel isolated is the lack of human exchange, the lack of touch, of contact, of um, you feeling uh, the sort of uh, safety and security that comes from your your human social networks. Um, so absolutely, I couldn't, um, you know, I think we all fundamentally agree with that. And also, of course, it, it goes back to the point that Michael was championing, which is that so much of this is about mental health um, and thinking about ways of strengthening community resilience and well-being, um, not just in basic um, medicalized health terms, but in thinking about mental health as well. So uh, lots of, of great food for thought there. Thank you so much, Saeed. Um, I want to jump back to our colleagues um uh from uh, uh who are focusing much more on the regional scale and at the local scale um and maybe we could turn to to tama um and i'd just like to know what sort of from what's the feedback that you've had from some of the actors you've engaged with on your training uh, what have they found most sort of useful uh what have they said is has been really most sort of valuable and replicable um based on on the different materials and resources that you provided to them Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I think the most of the feedbacks are very encouraging, uh, and uh, it was a good model uh, what we have started at the education program, because it is not only a didactic uh, method of uh, training. It was including the workshops, and uh, it was also including the different actors, and the, the sectorial experts were just uh, giving uh, some uh, specific explanations about the uh, issues. And also, uh, we just enriched the, uh, the training with uh, some projects. So in order to uh, the, uh, the attendants to get more, uh, more, uh, more accustomed to the uh, SDGs, 
uh, we ask them to prepare some projects and uh, how they can implement uh, some solutions in their community and uh, then they make a, a project presentation. So it was a hands-on uh, training in that. So it was a, a good motivation for us uh, to continue. And uh, later on, we got uh, support from the Union of Municipalities. And then we reached uh, at, uh, a very uh, high figure of uh, number of participants, even uh, 1,000 uh, participants uh, at the end. So uh, if you look, it's a different um, uh, a training, and it was just uh, also getting the interest of the, uh, the next uh, participants, and they are asking uh, when th we are going to continue again. And uh, we believe the power of the cities, uh, so it is, it is critical. We want to start from the cities because uh, they are a, a good role uh, model for the other uh, society, the parts. And also uh, what we have uh, realized, as uh, Michael has stated, uh, it's good to start from the cities. Uh, for instance, at the end of the workshop, which we have uh, initiated this, uh, this program, uh, there was a declaration was decided, uh, just a joint decision of the, uh, the participants, the mayors and the representatives of the, uh, the municipalities. And they were just admitting to uh, adopt the uh, Paris Agreement and uh, they uh, were also declaring that uh, they are going to have uh, uh, action plans for their cities. And this is critical because uh, at this time, the Turkey uh, was not adopt the Paris Agreement yet. So before the uh, government, the local governments has just uh, give their heart to work on this issue. What I'm really enjoying about this discussion is that we really are talking about action at such different scales. You know, we've got the examples of, of very hyper local tools, um, you know, being used in Bangladesh for individuals wrestling with their own challenges, as well as communities. Um, the Eco Park, which is, of course, about a community. And then Tama talking about you know, local government, city engagement, municipalities, so kind of training the, uh, the institutional frameworks. Um, so that it can feed down that way. Um, and I wanted to go back to the national level with you, Chol, um, and, and understand a little bit more um, about, you know, what did the national government in, in your exchange, what did they identify were the kind of main benefits of this approach that you'd, you'd presented to them of a, you know, bottom up regionalized um, approach? What did they identify as the benefits and what parts of it do you think they might replicate moving forward? Well, I think I think the I think there are two main parts that benefit them the most. I think the first thing is that um, they 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 saw that using SDG is quite necessary um, in framing a discussion uh, everywhere, both at national level and regional level. And when we combine the foresight techniques, which is something that um, be being talked about in the policy circle at the moment. They're, they're quite interested in that. So so when we combine SDGs and foresight, uh, I think um, it allows them to learn new tools and I think they can adapt those kind of um, tool to other kinds of policies. Right now, we, we're trying to put, push forward um, this kind of tools in, in the, uh, the research planning agency. No, but uh, if possible, we want to push forward to other other agencies as well. So I think that is the first thing that they find it beneficial. And the second thing is that um, uh, for the planning agency, the research planning agency, they, they uh, really want to make sure that uh, their research fund, when allocated to like local areas, is actually benefiting the locals. Um, but at the moment when it's top down, the research program that they designed are kind of missing some important elements that fits with local needs. So um, I think that is the second thing that the pl uh, research planning agency uh, find it very beneficial because they can finally um, see the gap, why is actually the gap in the policy. And they at least they inform me that they will use uh, the findings from, from our project to, to fill in those gaps and then um, add some more issues um, so that the research funding can be allocated in order to tackle some of the local and regional um, important issues. So I think that that are the two main important things that they find beneficial from, from our project. Um, I think one, one last thing. I think the last thing that 
that they find beneficial is that the process and the network that emerges um, along the way. Um, in the past two years, we, we have been working with like six regional teams and that builds a lot of social capital. And the regional teams also work with several stakeholders in the region. Um, so the research planning agency see that this is like a good channel to um, encourage the utilization of knowledge at the local level. So, so uh, yeah, that those are the three benefits that I think the government see in our project. So that, that's why they, they buy into to what we propose to them. Thanks, Joel. Can I play devil's advocate for a minute and come back to you on something, which is, of course, you are in a university um, collaborating with the SDSN network, which is largely academic, uh, although it does have a mix of members, and you are appealing to the national government to the research um, strategy arm, so the people developing the research and innovation plan um, for the government. Um, so sort of uh, like-minded uh, individuals interested in learning new policy tools, new ways of analyzing, kind of planning and so on. But have you had any sense that this could go, this method could go beyond the research departments, essentially? Could this be replicated by other ministries or departments across the government? And do you think these, these techniques have got the potential to be used um, in other ministries and departments in other countries? I, I, I think it's very, um, I, I think there is a high potential that this can be replicated in other ministries or even in other places. Because actually, um, when we use SDG as a framework, combining with foresight techniques, which is the techniques that allow us to uh, involve stakeholders in designing their, uh, their futures and also backcasting um, and then design the strategic directions to achieve that goal. This is a process that can be uh, replicated in other ministries. I mean, the part that is about the research is actually after that, after after we know the aspirations, after we know the strategic directions that they want to, to, to take in order to achieve those goals, then we use that to analyze the gap in the research uh, projects that existing. So so that 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 was actually the key. So so the first part, SDG framework and foresight techniques can be replicated a, at any level, I would say, because because SDG framework allow us to frame things differently. It allows us to frame things in a more integrated way, inclusive way. Um, and the foresight techniques allow us to um, engage people with more uh, evidence base, with more um, well-designed um, questions and processes um, in the participatory um, approach, I would say. So yeah, I, I think it can, it has a high potential to be replicated in, in other places, yes. Great, thanks, Joel. Stephanie, can I come back to you? Because you are also proposing um, a kind of a tool, an approach, a methodology, if you will, and are trying to sort of promote its wider use and uptake. Um, do you have examples of where um, this, this mediation has been used in other contexts? Um, and um, uh, what, you know, what do you think is going to be key to making sure it is replicated in other uh, communities? Thank you, Jessica. I, I wanted to come back to what Carlos said and then come back to what you were saying just before, and it's linked to your question. So the, the, the good thing with the social mediation program is that not only can be replicated in other contexts, and we already had exchanges with Carlos over the months because we actually have been in, in touch for the past one year almost. So. Uh, as, as such, the social mediation program can be adjusted to any uh, societal challenge anywhere in the world because it is uh, highly um, rely, reliant on the local communities themselves. So the first step is, of course, through this uh, train the trainer is to is to have a good understanding of, of the mutual mutual understanding of what is needed to address a specific societal challenge. So. Basically, the solution can be embedded into what Carlos is doing or anyone else is doing. That's the first thing. Uh, and we have successful examples of this happening already. So we have had um, members of the social mediators uh, network, which we created, 
um, who replicated, replicated already the, the solution in Asia, in uh, India, and also in Lebanon. So they have been able to um, address new societal challenges within their communities by training new uh, social mediators and addressing a particular issue in their communities. So that's the first thing. And then the, the replication can also happen um, um, across the, uh, the methodology. So you asked, uh, you know, the previous question you asked was about whether from a research perspective a project can actually uh, adopt a more uh, grassroots or practical or civic, civic society perspective. And what we did is that we work through a university uh, that is a member of the SDSN, uh, local SDSN, SDSN Cyprus, but we work together with a non-profit organization. So it's Euclid Cyprus and I claim that work together. So we basically managed to close the gap, close the gap of the research by having, you know, uh, the, the background of, of the university and the facilities and the support of the university and the research framework, but also we're able to talk directly to civil society and to communities through a non-profit organization that actually develops the solution. So I think that's maybe another takeaway and another, another possible success of the solution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, I, I, again, very inspiring to hear that it's already being so widely replicated um, and has been tried in so many contexts. Um, I, I'm, we're going to have to conclude the panel discussion in a minute um, and turn to our, our keynote speaker, Jeffrey Sachs. Um, before we do that, I want to just do one quick round um, to all of our speakers one more time and just ask you to share a final remark, uh, a very brief uh, thought, parting thought. We have eight years to go um, until we reach the 2030 deadline of the SDGs. I don't know about you, but I feel like the SDG summit was yesterday. And the fact that we now only have eight years is very intimidating. Um, so there's a huge challenge ahead of us and some very large, you know, what feel like intractable problems, uh, be it in resource management, in conflict, in um, climate uh, resilience, uh, a whole range of different themes that we've discussed today. Um, for each of you, I would be really um, uh, grateful if you could just offer one final parting thought on what do you think is really required to take some of these solutions to scale and to catalyze the kinds of rapid action we need um, to get to our, um, our very broad objectives uh, defined in the SDGs by 2030. Um, so can I start with you, Saeed? Um, and just ask if there's one thing you think is going to be really fundamental um, for scaling up these solutions and catalyzing rapid action. Uh, what do you think that might be? Uh, thank you, Jessica. Actually, uh, I think you have touched a very important point. And SDG, even before the pandemic started, uh, had a yawning gap of funding deficit close to $2.53 trillion. As you can imagine, uh, post-pandemic years will be quite challenging because a development fund will be shrinking while the aspirations will keep on rising. So the most, I mean, the foremost challenge would be how do we make better use of less resources? Even now, I'll give you a simple figure. I mean, when we vaccinate one million people, the GDP globally goes up by $8 billion. And you know the current plight is only half of the world is vaccinated. We are not out of the woods yet. So if you imagine by 2023, 24, we are finally out of the woods, I mean, all those variants and everything, we will be in a situation 2030, in between time, we'll be hardly five to six years. It will be a huge challenge. Even before the pandemic, it was a challenge. So as it is 17, which we used to speak in a more lighter tone, the multi-stakeholder partnership, we have to speak in a much, much, much bigger tone with much more strength. That means every actor, government, private sector, NGOs, civil society, will have to do much more stronger role. Mm -hmm. And my parting thought would be, just th follow the three simple Ds. Develop what you think should be done, do it with passion, and drive it forward. 
and the small digital kick showed you we did not talk to any government in South Asia and you know South Asia is one of the most fragmented region in the world but we did reach out to 1.8 billion people we didn't speak to anybody people responded so boundaries exist in maps not in people's mind so if you want to talk about global we have to start thinking global not in only our academic papers but in the action that we do this is a very small initiative but the message is very powerful we could reach 1.8 billion people using digital connectivity on our own and we came together so no matter which part of the world each of us is each of us has a role to play and it's the small things that makes the big difference that would be my take thank you jessica thank you so much um, very wise and inspiring words there, um, and I think a call to all of us that you know, you're, it's never you're even as an individual, um, you're never at too small a scale to take action, um, and just amazing to see the amount of impact that Digital Kick has had and the a number of people that you've reached. So really inspiring. Um, if I could turn now to um, actually, since I can see you on the right of my screen, Tama, can I turn to you next and ask what your final reflection would be? What do you think is really going to help yeah, drive change? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> I think uh, the, we need more innovative approach. So in order to just fulfill the requirements of SDG, all SDGs, uh, we have to think uh, in a different way. So what we have realized in uh, the, those workshops, uh, there are some creative ways to uh, solve the problems. So uh, I believe that working all together and uh, building more partnerships, we can overcome otherwise uh, we will have more difficulties for a sustainable world in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tana, for thinking creatively and focusing on partnerships. Um, fabulous. Stephanie, can I come to you next? Yes, thank you, Jessica. I just, I'm just going to echo what was said before. I. Uh, the words were taken out of my mouth. Uh, it's it's all about contextualization and localization. I also think that you know we don't have enough narrative at the moment at the uh, international level, and that more work needs to be done at the local level. So this emerging narrative of of global governance uh, needs much more work, and that work relies on projects like the ones we're presenting today. So on local solutions that are a prerequisite to uh, awareness at the international and global level. So continue what we are doing, yes, definitely, and developing new interactive tools that are a mix of, um, of you know, in-person, on the ground, grassroots level action, and interactive tools. And I would say, uh, one step further, the incorporation of those methods and solutions into the curriculum into the education curriculum, which is obviously at the heart of the SDG 2030 strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, really good points there and uh, about contextualization, but I really like your point as well about thinking about reframing this global narrative and thinking about much more about its local relevance um, and how to engage local actors in it, um, in this call to arms, if you will, that is our sustainable development challenge. Um, Carlos, can I turn to you? In, based on your experiences, the project that you've been doing, what do you think is one really fundamental um, uh, sort of priority to scale um, effectively? Gracias. La prioridad está primero en poder definir, como este es un piloto que estamos diseñando. Eh, terminar de definirlo y ajustarlo para poderlo replicar y hacer escalable a cualquier nivel. Eso es lo fundamental. Lo segundo es que efectivamente el proyecto impacte a las comunidades y efectivamente aporte al logro de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, porque como ustedes han visto o han escuchado, Tenemos la comunidad, tenemos el medio ambiente, tenemos el ecosistema. Es decir, el, lo que tenemos que lograr todas las comunidades es el mejor aprovechamiento de los recursos ecosistémicos que nos está dando la naturaleza. Esa es la clave para poder lograr un éxito y poder cumplir todas las metas que se han planteado los países 
al 2030, al 2050, algunos al 2025 ya quieren hacer cosas tempranas. Luego, esto es un proceso donde todos ya creo que hay un gran movimiento mundial de entendimiento a que hay que trabajar en el logro de cumplir las metas de los ODS. Gracias. Thank you. So thank you for the question. And, um, so the priority is, of course, to, for us to define the pilot and to finish it so it can be replicated um, and have a real impact in, in the community and bring, and bring them really something um, to really have an impact and include the SDGs uh, on the project. They, they co it's important to bring all together, the community, the protection of the environment, uh, all these components should be not only a holistic vision, uh, but it's also a holistic action. So all together um, to work for um, all the SDGs that um, we are talking about today. And I consider that is um, everyone is taking into consideration this and is more and more something that everyone is understanding that we need to work together. Thank you very much. Chol, our final 30 seconds before we have to, to turn to Jeff. Um, what do you see as the one, what's your final recommendation for how we can encourage the scalability of these solutions? Yes, uh, I would just add to others' ideas that um, we need to bring people together and utilize the existing resource and knowledge. But to do that, to scale and to catalyze the rapid actions, we actually need a supporting system for SDGs implementation, like capacity building facilities, finance for development for non-state actors, accurate and timely data for policy and practical uses, uh, science policy interface, and also domestic consultation process as a feedback mechanism to allow the government to be accountable to people and to allow every, everyone to learn with each other. So I think we, we kind of lack of supporting system for SDG implementation and we need that. So I think that would encourage and accelerate the process more effectively. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Joel. That's no small recommendation there. So um, going, you know, thinking about the collaboration and many of the themes that others have raised, but also just stressing that we need much stronger sort of institutional architectures to support means of implementation. Um, so fabulous. I just want to, to say that one thing I've really taken away from all of you and your great remarks is the point that Saeed said, which is whatever you're doing, do it with passion. And it's clear that you're all incredibly enthusiastic about your, your projects and your solutions, and rightly so, they're really inspiring. So thank you so much to all of you um, for your great remarks and for sharing with us the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, and it's just amazing to hear how many people that you've managed to touch with these programs. So thank you. Um, speaking about doing things with passion, uh, we're about to hear from a man who could not be more passionate about the Sustainable Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Challenge if he tried. Uh, we're going to be joined by Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Um, I'm sure he needs no introduction, but um, just as a reminder, he is um, currently the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. He's also the president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, who, of course, are our hosts of the Global Solutions Forum. So we're very much looking, to hear, looking forward to hearing from you, Jeff. Um, can I turn to you now? Joining us from America, I believe. Ooh. Yes, thank you so much, uh, uh, Jess, and uh, what a wonderful panel, and uh, good afternoon to all my friends on the panel, Munir and Carlos, Stephanie, Chol, Tamer. Thank you for all the wonderful work. There is really very little for me to add in these closing minutes because the discussion has been so rich and the examples so clear. So I can be very brief, and, and I will be very brief. There are three main points that I want to underscore from what we've heard. The first is that we are engaged in a, a new kind of problem solving. We're dealing with underlying deep transformations of our societies and of the whole world. Uh, we're trying to reconcile economic development, social justice, and environmental sustainability. And these are challenges that earlier generations did not face, did not understand, and uh, did not uh, confront the way we do. 
Uh, so we heard from uh, all of the panelists, and uh, I thought Chol was uh, really especially pertinent <clears throat> on the methodologies, the use of uh, foresight, goal-based planning, backcasting. Uh, it, all of you, when Munir emphasized uh, the importance of participation, the ability through digital tools to get very large-scale participation, uh, the need for partnerships <clears throat> also, as Carlos uh, was emphasizing. So we're engaged in a new kind of problem solving. That's the first point. Our politics are not really geared to sustainable development uh, in any natural way. It's a, it's a new experience for our generation. Uh, the second point is that uh, we are engaged in a holistic challenge. I like to emphasize six main transformations. Uh, could you excuse me for one moment? I think Jess had a, a brief issue. Thanks so much to all of you for your patience. He left us right on a cliffhanger there with his six. Um, I apologize, <laughs> somebody at the, at the door. <laughs> Don't worry. Jeff, you left us on a cliffhanger. So, uh, said there six, this six is a Zoom, Zoom world. Uh, so uh, opening the door and back to you. Uh, we are engaged in a holistic uh, challenge and I'd like to emphasize six main transformations that we face that are all interconnected. I won't belabor that point. The first is education, skills, innovative capacity. Uh, we need a major upgrading uh, in our societal skills, education in the formal level from uh, pre-K through uh, tertiary education, adult education, public awareness, education for sustainable development. That's transformation number one. Transformation number two, and obviously the pandemic underscores it, uh, we, we need a fundamental uh, upgrading of our health systems, both our public health capacities and our uh, curative health, our, our health care facility systems. A lot of people in the world have almost no access to formal health care. We have seen how deficient our public health systems are in confronting the pandemic. The third major transformation is to green technologies uh, in industry. So decarbonization of the energy system, circular economy. The fourth great transition is sustainable land use. We're destroying habitats, we're destroying ecosystems, uh, we're losing the sustainability of our food systems. We are releasing carbon from the vegetative cover, from the soils, from uh, the forests as they are cut, sustainable land use. The fifth great transformation is sustainable urban environments where currently it's estimated that 55% of the world lives and it will be 70% before we blink an eye. And that's potentially good. I like cities. I live in the middle of Manhattan, but uh, we need cities that are viable, livable, green, healthful, and uh, with uh, billions of people coming to cities, especially Asian cities and African cities in the next 30 years, uh, we'll need new kinds of sustainable urban design. And the sixth transformation, which is uh, pervasive, and it, it's uh, exemplified by what we're doing right now, is the digital transformation. We have new powerful digital tools for everything, for education, for outreach, for connectivity, for payment systems, for finance, uh, for healthcare delivery, for government service delivery, for infrastructure management. But we know that half the world is not yet on the internet, not that it couldn't be, but we don't have the financial models for uh, the poorer half of the world. And so this is a major challenge as well as continuing to design the digital tools uh, for, for
for example, universal access to quality education, universal access to medicine through telemedicine and remote diagnostics, remote uh, image reading, many things that can readily be done now. So that's the second major point I want to make. Think holistically. Uh, choose your favorite of those six transformations and work on them. There is huge problem solving, whether it's in education, healthcare, uh, energy transformation, land use sustainability, urban design, digital applications. The third point that I want to underscore, and Stephanie mentioned it uh, at the end, and I simply wanted to underline it, underline it, underline it. Uh, and the fact that we're all educators uh, also uh, comes into this, we should be putting this kind of problem solving into the curriculum. Of course, at the university level, teaching students about problem solving, about the new tools, about the techniques, about participatory problem solving, uh, design, foresight, and so on. This is a clear, but also in the lower grades, in pre-K through Upper secondary, we have young people who are yearning to help address the challenges that they're going to face for their whole lifetime. And it would be wonderful. In fact, we're instructed by target 4.7 of the SDGs to put education for sustainable development into the curriculum. So I want to ask educators all over the world, all of our leading panel members, Let's also think about how we can contribute to basically a, a mass generalized education in these issues, in sustainable development, in global citizenship. Let's work with the ministers of education. Let's work with our school systems. If you're a university, you've got a local school district that you can work with. Help young people to gain the knowledge technically about sustainable development, but also the experience in problem solving. Uh, groups of uh, young people can work with mayors and city councils uh, to think about the strategies for decarbonizing the local energy system or making the urban environment more sustainable. I think we can add a tremendous amount of education for sustainable development and experiential based problem solving to the curriculum at all levels. SDSN has uh, initiated a major project uh, called Mission 4.7 because Target 4.7 calls for universal education for sustainable development. And I would welcome everyone to join Mission 4.7. Just contact me or Jess or uh, your uh, SDSN uh, leaders uh, within countries or regions and get involved. So let me thank you for this wonderful panel. Uh, let me emphasize uh, the three points, the problem solving, the societal transformations, and the educational opportunities uh, that we face and turn it back over to you, Jess. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, a fabulous remarks. And yes, I think that you've done a brilliant job of bringing us back to sort of a, an overarching challenge for all of us, which is that we're all in the privileged position um, of being here today at a global conference, of being able to speak to large audiences of people, you know, be it either uh, in such a, a prestigious moment as this with G-Stick, but or just in our communities um, or in our universities. And let's really use that to try and amplify um, some of the lessons that have been learned from these interesting solutions to share um, these solutions with as many groups as possible. And also just to encourage other uh, people at every level and at every age to start thinking about how they can identify solutions themselves. Um, you know, as Saeed said again, uh, you're, it's, even at the individual level, you can have a huge impact on some of these sustainable development challenges. So we've got no excuse. Um, and with digital tools and technologies, we can reach out to huge numbers of people uh, relatively rapidly. So really inspiring discussion from everyone. Thank you so much. I'd encourage everyone who's been visiting online or watching in person to visit the website, either the UN SDSN website, 
the Panorama website or the globalsolutionsforum.org website to hear more and to read a bit more about all of these projects and initiatives. And again, just want to thank you all for your time. I'm not with you in person, but for those of you who are in Dubai, I would encourage you to please put your hands together and give a round of applause to our wonderful panel members um, and to our other colleagues who joined us virtually. And to, of course, to Professor Sachs um, for his excellent closing remarks. Thanks to you all. Uh, we look forward to seeing how these projects develop and we look forward to the fourth Global Solutions Forum, um, hopefully this time next year. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.